Hey everyone, welcome to Biblio.com, used and rare book marketplace featuring over 100 million used, rare, and out of print books. In celebration of our Biblio.live virtual book fair, we're going to be doing a series featuring some book collectors and their collections. Uh, today, we're going to be chatting with Margaret Grace Myers. Now, Margaret Grace Myers is an avid reader, writer, and collector with an MFA in nonfiction writing from Goucher College, an MTS from Harvard Divinity School, and a BA from Skidmore College. Margaret has curated a book collection with a theme that's long been the topic of controversy in the U.S., women's sex education. Throughout her career as a collector, she's been sourcing American books from the 19th and 20th centuries, gathering evidence of the entanglement between medicine and morality in public sex education. Inspired by her collection and my current events, Margaret is now writing a book on sex education in the United States from 1900 until present day, set to launch in fall of 2023. Margaret, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat. Me too. Um, this is something that I and the entire team have been really excited to talk to you about <laughs> oh, for a while. So um, they so are ready and waiting to take a look at this. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how it led to the inspiration to begin this collection? Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, most people I know who have some big project came to it in some sort of weird side way. And I am definitely uh, in that number. So I I've always been interested in kind of thinking about reproductive rights and in, in a sort of broad sense, and especially thinking about religion and also medicine. A lot of that, I think, comes from when I was just growing up as a person. And I, I graduated from high school in 2009. And I remember there's a lot of talk about gay marriage in during that time. And I remember even just as a high schooler thinking, you know, man, there's a lot of stuff with religion that is coming in here that I kind of am seeing that that I kind of can't really trace academically like what's going on here just as a purely sort of academic question was really interesting to me and so when I went to college and I always loved you know reading and writing that was just what I loved the most mm -hmm. um, and when I went to college I studied English and religion I was always just really interested in lived religion so how are people actually sort of practicing their religion in the world. Um, after college, I went to grad school. I went to Harvard Divinity School where I got an MTS, which is a master's of theological studies where I studied religion, ethics, and politics. So for that, really what I thought was most interesting was just seeing, you know, how do my, my interest was in America, what is the political situation that allows really American Christianity to be the voice that it is today in America? And coming in with sort of my always interest in rights around reproduction, freedom to choose marriage was just something that I was always aware of as a person and kind of, again, tracing where does that come from? from um, a religious point of view, where do we get these ideas? That's just always been my interest. I went to Goucher College where I got my MFA in nonfiction writing. And there, what was really interesting to me was that was what really plugged in this kind of medical piece for me, which was all this stuff felt like it was sort of floating around <laughs> kind of in a big pot of <laughs> soup or something that had not yet turned into soup and like all the ingredients are on the cutting board and I'm like please <laughs> turn into something um and I was researching the turn of the century Baltimore 20th century you know some of these doctors and what was going on which was fascinating to me was there was this huge rise in sexually transmitted infections and venereal diseases and people were really trying to figure out, you know, what do we do? They were saying, what do we do? And there were not the medical options that were available to us today. And so we get this partnership between religious voices and medical voices. And because of that moment in time, that partnership, we really could only offer one solution, which was, you know, kind of get married young and sort of be abstinent before that. And so that partnership was also sort of the birth of the sex ed movement. They sort of said, we also need to show people, tell them how, you know, that there actually are risks to having sex, basically. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, that's why we have sex ed, which is something we, we still have. And 
And interestingly, kind of hasn't changed that much because then when I started realizing that, I sort of started seeing, oh, the conversations that people were having about sex ed 120 years ago are the same exact conversations that we're seeing today, even though so many other things have changed. So medicine has changed so much. You know, religion has, religion is so interesting, always going to be changing in different interesting ways. Um, but certainly American Christianity is quite different than it was in 1900. But the arguments around sex ed and how we talk to young people about sex are really still the same. And that and that sort of push and pull between how much information do we talk to young people about in the world of medicine and how do you know do we keep it just to be purely medical or do we talk about it in terms of ethics and morals that push and pull really became the drive of basically what I write about and um wow. as a person who loves books I obviously started I mean maybe not obviously but I immediately was like I have to find every book I can possibly find about this and I actually found way more in the world of books than I ever kind of thought I would. I am so, I was really surprised by what I found and things that I realized were kind of totally in a kind of about sex ed that I would never have guessed were books about sex ed, which can is you amazing. elaborate. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually, I can do like a little show and tell if that's I cool. That. Yes. Okay. So this, I actually realized I was thinking this was my, probably my first ever in my collection. And it was way before any of this ever started. Um, I think my mom brought it. She and I have very similar sensibilities and she brought it home for me, probably from a yard sale when I was in high school. So more than 10 years ago. And it's this pamphlet and it says, so you think it's love. It's just a little paper pamphlet. It's from the public affairs committee or yeah. What does it say? Public affairs public affairs pamphlets. Mm -hmm. And I think we thought it was sort of funny. You know, we were like, this is sort of a, it's a funny kind of quirky, sort of cute 1950, you know, mid-century. But then now that I know what this is, this is the first version that I had. And then a, just a few years ago, so I've had this for more than 10 years now, just because I had it and I liked it. Then I got this version, the, which is the same exact thing and a lot with other public health things. So this was, this one doesn't say this, but this one says that it's produced and distributed by the Georgia Department of Public Health. So this is really, even though if you didn't know this or what I thought, <laughs> what? This is just why. <laughs> so when I thought I was like, oh, it's kids like dating tips. This right. is really about like, young and don't have sex with anybody and also sexually transmitted infections are real and um you'll die if you you know basically if you have sex is is the subtext to this. <laughs> like this is a public health the georgia department of public health published a pamphlet that says so you think it's love and so when we talk about <laughs> marriage and pamphlets and you know it's like I actually think of this as being my first ever like sex ed book and I've had it forever and I had no idea that it was about sex ed when I first got it basically. <laughs> right you probably thought it was a cute little example of 1950s totally. culture. Yeah exactly sort of like quirky you know I was going to be mm -hmm. like and, and they are you know it is funny to all I, I still think those things are sort of funny when it talks about you know talking about teenagers and you know go to a dance but you know this is this is about choosing a happy marriage. And because they really thought, you know, so much of what sex ed was meant to do for a long time was to promote a marriage that was going to be healthy, which meant, mm -hmm. you know, you were going to remain faithful so that you wouldn't spread any sexually transmitted infections, but also that the people who were worried a lot about sex ed were also worried about rising divorce rates. And so mm -hmm. when we talk about marriage, it was actually this huge kind of national concern far beyond any idea of like love, which is how I sort of thought about it for so long. Right. Yeah. So at right. this point I am sort of way beyond what your question was, but <laughs> no, this is mode. absolutely fascinating. <laughs> and I can really see how starting this collection has really just launched your interest in activism and, you know, actively adding to your collection has had how that has influenced your upcoming book. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm always on the lookout for 
more things, you know, for, for books. So I'm writing this book now and it's really, um, a hist it's really quite a history. And I acquire things basically based on, you know, things that spark my interest in my research and all, you know, if I, if there's something that looks interesting to me that I haven't ever heard of before, I am, you know, I immediately will go online and see if I can find it, you know, and see what, see what it looks like, see if I can get my hands on a good copy of it. And it's great because it means that I have things from, you know, 1896. And then I'll even have things like abstinence only textbooks from 2001, you know, and those to me actually yeah. exist in the same collection, which I think is fun. You know, I think it's actually nice to have kind of a living, breathing collection that illustrates kind of the real breadth of, of this topic. And having such wide publication dates, you know, really allows you to observe firsthand how the conversation has changed, if at all. It doesn't sound like it has. It's, it's so interesting because the conversation hasn't changed, as we've talked about, but the books, of course, have, you know, which is so interesting right. is that like, you know, they start as these big, huge, you know, this, this book is one of my, this really important one, it's called Social Diseases in Marriage. And social mm -hmm. diseases is a word, you know, a, a phrase that they use to, to refer to venereal diseases, sexually transmitted mm -hmm. infections, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, this guy, Dr. Prince Morrow was kind of, I consider him to sort of be the father of sex education in the United States. You know, and this was really the first book kind of in the United States that basically said popularly, you know, for kind of, I mean, really meant for doctors, but a wider public as well. You know, these sexually transmitted infections are a big deal. As a doctor, we should be talking about them. We should be talking mm -hmm. about them to our patients, especially in talking about them in terms of marriage. Something you and I had chatted about was mm -hmm that during this time period, so this book was published in 1906. And during this time, there was this big controversy over if you had a patient as a doctor, if you had a patient and his wife, because really the doctor kind of tended to consider the husband, the patient, no matter what, mm -hmm. and his wife presented with gonorrhea, the doctors would had there, there was, there were such things, you know, that they actually had, um, full on like debates about whether or not wives should be told that they had gonorrhea in their own human bodies, which is, crazy. Um, <laughs> which is crazy to me. And, you know, I think a lot most, hopefully, um, people now looking now, you know, and they really say, you know, some, some of these doctors were like, well, it, they, it, it can't, they can't do anything about it. So why would we tell them? Because all it will do is disrupt the marriage relation. You know, all it will mm -hmm. do is upset the marriage as if these doctors had a responsibility to the marriage as an institution, Probably which is so fast. To protect the husband. To you protect know, 100% to yes, protect the husband. Right. <laughs> um, it's so that is really what we see in this book is some of that kind of piecing together, trying to figure out how do we, you know, what he really realized is and said and sort of set out for the first time was as a doctor, you know, there are a lot of things that you can kind of handle on kind of just a medical level, sexually transmitted infections, um, <laughs> which is not I didn't expect in my life to say that phrase this as much as I do, like all day long. As publicly. Um, as this publicly without, yes. you know, I'm just, you, I become very comfortable with it. But, you know, he said it, it presents a problem because he really realized and sort of set out for the first time publicly in a more public way that venereal diseases, sexually transmitted infections presented for doctors a problem where they really couldn't just say, we're just doing medicine. That it represented a whole universe of ethics of the family. Because if you see a woman who is married and she has gonorrhea, if you don't tell her, well, first of all, you're you know, from, from the modern perspective, like you're lying to your patient, you know, you're right, like, right. There's, like, that. Oh God, <laughs> there's that, um, you're not, you know, but if, if you're a doctor in 1901 or whatever, you're admitting to your patient that 
her husband may have had an affair, which all of a sudden you're blowing up a marriage or, and what's something that he was, and what rhetorically, when you read these books, what rhetorically he did more than, and what was really valuable that he did was he basically said, you know, if, if we don't step in and kind of say something, if we don't treat this as a big deal, we are going to have generations of people with sexually transmitted infections because syphilis and mm -hmm. gonorrhea can be passed to children in childbirth um, or syphilis is congenital. And I guess, I, I guess I'm not a doctor, right. so I'm sort of like, <laughs> and I'm also like, I'm like, when I publish this book, I really need to make sure that I get it back checked because I'm also yeah. going off of what they knew in 1901. So I'm like, this is what they thought was true. So whether it's true or not, it's what they thought, you know, so That's excellent point. You know, um, <laughs> I always have to like keep that in mind when I'm writing and then be like, I'm going to have to, you know, double back here and make sure that I, you know, because what they thought was of course very important because they were going off of what they knew. But yeah, so he basically said, one of the things that was really a very potent quotation for me from him which I won't get exactly right, you know, is that he, it goes beyond just the patient, is mm -hmm. that if you have a patient, you're also, of course, it's the man, which sexism is very bad, obviously, but, you know, he's like, you go beyond the patient, you have the wife, you have the children, you have the children's children, you know, that all of a sudden, you can't just be like, it's just my, my guy, he had gonorrhea 10 years ago, it's no big deal. You really all of a sudden have the entire world in front of you basically yeah who <laughs> and, are all unprotected, who are all a unprotected. Secret. Yeah. and it's and it's 1901 so not only so it's not today where you can say here are safe sex methods so that's what this book is so important to me this social diseases and marriage because he was really one of the first people to say so we need to tell people about sex basically including just that like what the body parts are what the reproductive organs are that has been fascinating. Like I love to look at old high school textbooks and the older you go, you know, and you look and you, you know, you can, there's this 1901 biology textbook for high schoolers and there's no section about the reproductive organs. So if you, I always say like, if you were an alien and you came to earth and you had this biology textbook, you would be like, I guess humans don't reproduce because there just wasn't any information about it. Are you currently sourcing your books? <laughs> yeah, so I, I do a lot of online stuff. If I have something in particular, like Biblio is awesome, obviously. Thank eBay, you. yes, the best, of course. <laughs> um, if I'm looking for something, I like cast a wide net. eBay <laughs> tends to have some good stuff if, for you sure. know, whatever I can find. I also like a lot of people who love books. I, I have a sort of whimsical way of, where at this point, like if I'm not looking for something in particular, there's nothing better than walking into a used bookstore and just being like, what do you have for me universe? <laughs> Which is a little yes. silly, you know, way to think about it. But this book, I have not been sourcing a lot of stuff. This is from, this is from 1878. These two books are from 1878, collected in 1902 together. These two books, it's called okay. Dr. Hollick's Complete Works, The, the Marriage Guide, because the only way we can really talk about marriage, or we can only talk about sex, is by just making sure that it's within marriage. Oh so anytime I see the word marriage, I'm like, oh, that's code for sex, which is so interesting. Uh -oh. um, because it's like, you can't ever, nobody was ever having sex outside of marriage. It's like, oh, wait. Really? human beings. So because I've sort of moved beyond that, this era in my writing, I'm not looking for too much stuff from here just because otherwise I wouldn't have any money if I bought every single book that I wanted to. But when I saw this, I had to get it, which is like the most amazing paper flaps oh my, of human anatomy that I've ever seen. Um, and then you can see there's the fetus in wow. there. Um, that is really cool. It's very cool. And then of course, like, I didn't know this when I looked it up, but then of course, as soon as I did, I was like, duh. Um, he was charged for obscenity because a woman's body, like for his lectures, basically. Well, clearly which, he's overstepped, have, clearly. Yeah, <laughs> by just, you know, and I, and that's, that I think is where now I really consider myself an advocate for what is called comprehensive sex education. It's just a framework that teaches sex ed that's medically accurate, age appropriate and inclusive. But when I think about that, and I think that this person was charged for obscenity for that. And I think 
we all have bodies. It's just <laughs> what we carry around with us. Right. We, we should just know what's going on. That's yes, and exactly to, how we've all entered the world. We I have mean. all entered the world that way. There's nothing you know, and the more, and I work with kids, like I, I'm also a preschool teacher. Like I spend time with kids. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, this book from the early seventies called the sex education racket pornography yeah. in the schools and expose. So, you know, it's like this people getting this upset to write this book or this one called sex education, the final plague, where you see that there's a whole book length, hardcover book of somebody who is this upset about sex ed in schools, that's when I realized like, oh, there needs to be advocacy on the other side of things that are, that is strong, um, which is, I have not seen. There aren't books yeah. that are like, sex ed is the best, you know, kind of on the opposite side of this. We just have these books, which are like, <laughs> it's, it's a racket, you know? Right. Um, there needs to be, um, you're seeing the need for people to demonstrate passion on the other side of yeah, that. There's a lot of really good resources. So there's like our bodies ourselves came out at a similar time, but mm -hmm. it's not an advocacy book. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's content about sex, but it's not advocacy for sex ed. You know, not that I think, not that this is like a blanket positive vibes for like both sides but it's just uh, that's what I have noticed is I'm like we need more advocacy for good sex ed and, and not so, just basic with a broad brush right and so you're uh, sorry to interrupt so your no, book no, no. will be um part education and part ad on the history and part advocacy yeah the, and the advocacy for me really just comes from demonstrable the history and kind of the all the data suggests that young people who get comprehensive sex ed, their outcomes are better in terms of both medical, like measurable health outcomes, such as lower rates of teen pregnancy, lower rates of STIs, or if not lower rates of STIs demonstrably, then more, more likelihood to use condoms, which of course we know lowers rates of STIs. It just comes from that. And also increases things like, so comprehensive sex ed is inclusive. It includes all, it includes things like gender identity, LGBTQ acceptance, consent in relationships, whereas abstinence only frameworks, which I will not bore you with the like multi-hour conversations about um, federal funding for uh, sex ed, but basically there are like no national laws about sex ed. Every state has its own thing. So some states are still doing abstinence only, which has been uh, rebranded as sexual risk avoidance. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't work, but you still can get federal funding for it, even though it's not evidence-based. And it's all just a headache. Nobody, I have not really seen a lot of advocacy for it. I have actually just in kind of the most in like the past six months, I think people are actually picking up on it a little bit more, which is very exciting. But yeah, I really awesome. come at it from a like history facts. And like, when I thought when I set out to write this book, I thought I was gonna start at 1901 and end at the AIDS epidemic, and kind of be like, here are my kind of two bookmarks. And then I was like, No, I have to go all the way I have to go all the way. So. <laughs> fascinating stuff you've certainly piqued my curiosity and you will be piquing the curiosity of probably most people who listen to this so, <laughs> so um, we're really excited to get this out there are you currently attending any book fairs or do you frequent any I am well I live on an island in Maine so right now I am mostly um, on my island in Maine <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of out online is my mm -hmm. if if any but yeah that tends to be my my way okay, to do good it. to know. Good to know. So we won't talk about like in person or yeah, like yeah. We'll we'll not talk about the book fair aspect then. Cool. <laughs> This has been so, oh my God. Yeah. You've definitely sparked a new obsession in me. Right. This has been incredibly informative and we all so appreciate your time and you willing to share your knowledge with us. Let's leave off with one final thought. What would you tell beginning book collectors who, you know, or people who are curious about book collecting? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. I obviously love talking about books and sex ed anytime I can. Yeah. I mean, I think I definitely 
didn't consider myself to be a book collector for a really long time, even though I had a book collection. Now looking back on it very clearly about a specific topic. Um, and it was actually through the wonderful work of Honey and Wax booksellers. And they have a contest for young book collectors. I think it's for people who are under 30 and or women who are under 30, I believe. And I was reading their call and I all of a sudden I was like, oh, I have a collection of books. <laughs> and even just through, I ended up being a runner up in their great contest, uh, I think two years ago. But even if I hadn't been selected, even just in writing this essay for them, for that collection, uh, for that contest, I realized and felt so empowered to be like, oh, of course I'm a book collector. I have a collection of books. Um, it sits on my shelf. It exists in this thing for me in this very personal, real way. And feeling that and becoming empowered and knowing that about myself has also made me feel better. And it's also, you know, it's made me feel more confident as a as a person, just because I love books, but also as a book collector. And it also has opened me up to this amazing community of book collectors and, you know, really interesting, cool, mm -hmm. smart people, because as we all know, you know, people who love old, cool books are the coolest people, <laughs> obviously. You know, obviously, and we think so too. And something we've been saying at Biblio lately, an idea that's really been catching on with us is, you know, really start with any any two books with anything in common, you got a collection, start there. I, totally. And I was, it's funny, I'm, I was just looking through old photos and I literally had just taken a photo. I had like three books about sex on my shelf in my old apartment in New York like three years ago, that was my collection. And now it is totally ballooned. It really was this moment of like, oh yeah, look, you know, look where I am now. Um, and it's <laughs> right. amazing and it's so fun and exciting. And it just, yeah. and it feels good to connect and to talk to people. And it's allowed me as a writer, you know, and obviously not every book collector is a writer, of course, but it's allowed me as a writer to make connections that I absolutely would not have made if I didn't have, you know, the physical object of the book with me. Right. And um, if you hadn't first labeled yourself as a collector, you might have missed out on the incredible like opportunity and network of people absolutely. you've been meeting along the way, which is 100 so awesome. percent. Oh, yeah. and also if if you tell your if you if people know that you collect books about a certain thing, it is and it's the best. It is all you will get as gifts for the rest of your life. And it is the best. Like that my is friend. So cool. It is, you know, people are always like, you like weird old sex things, right? And I'm like, I sure do. <laughs> yep, yep. And bring it, bring on. it on. You know, and I get a book in the mail and it's like a hundred years old and it's about syphilis. And I'm like, this is just what I want. I was like, I've never Fabulous. wanted anything more. Uh, we were actually interviewing another collector who said her collection came about unintentionally because people just started buying her stuff that yeah. had to do with her interests. And then it just yeah. piled up from there and um, yeah. kind of took off on its own. So yeah, one day you might look around and realize <laughs> you have a collection <laughs> right in front of you. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, 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 you'll be so thrilled about it. I'm sure. Margaret, before we take off, um, where can people learn more about you? Where can people sign up for updates on your book? Yeah. The book is right now tentatively called the fight for sex ed. It should be out in fall of 2023. I keep telling people if I write it fast enough, that's the plan. My website is Margaret Grace Myers. That's M Y E R S dot com. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Um, Twitter is Margaret G Myers and Instagram is Margaret Grace Myers. Mostly at this point, it's still just like pictures of my cat and the ocean and old books and that kind of thing. But one day there will be updates about the book and I will be very excited to share them. That sounds uh, fabulous. And we cannot wait to learn more from you. Thanks again for joining us. Of course. Thank you so much for having me.